Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are about to start this evening's program. Shall we please be on our Please can you resume your seat. The President of the Ghana Academy, Academy of Arts and Sciences, past presidents, fellows of the Academy, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, Students, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of fellows of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, I warmly welcome you to today's inaugural lecture to be delivered by a fellow of the Academy. The chairman for today's event is Professor Samuel Kofi Sefadede. He is the vice president of the sciences section of this Academy He's a, a fellow of the International Academy of Food Science and Technology, also a fellow of the Kellogg Foundation Leadership Program. He's the vice chairperson of the FAO WHO Codex Alimentarius Commission based in Rome and Geneva. He, he was the foundation dean of the Faculty of Engineering Sciences, University of Ghana. Chairman of the Planning Committee for the Establishment of Two Public Universities, University of Energy and Natural Resources, Sunyani, and University of Health and Allied Sciences, who He was the board chairman, Millennium Development Authority for Ghana's Millennium Challenge Compact I. He was the team lead, team lead consultant for the development and preparation of Ghana's second Millennium Challenge Compact. And he was the board chairman, Millennium Development Authority for Ghana's Millennium Challenge Compact II up to January 7, 2017. He is a professor in the Department of Food Process Engineering, University of Ghana. Shall we please welcome him? The President of the Academy, past Presidents of the Academy, the Vice Presidents, Fellows of the Academy, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and our students who are with us. This evening we have a distinguished Fellow of the Academy to give an inaugural lecture And a very, very important topic. Yesterday, there was a celebration of biodiversity. And it's being followed by this very distinguished lecturer to speak on understanding biodiversity as an infrastructure of life for development. We are indeed privileged to have with us as our distinguished speaker this evening, Professor Alfred Apau Oting Yeboa, a professor of plant biology with special interest in taxonomy, systematics, and vegetation studies, and a strong advocate for the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity at the national and international levels. If you read the summary of his bio about the speaker, you'll find that he stands tall both nationally and internationally on this very important topic. Professor Otin Yeboah, born at Achim Tafo, 
in the Eastern Region, was educated at AME Zion Primary and Middle Schools, Tafo Ebuelka State College in Kibi, University of Cape Coast, the University of Ghana, and the University of Edinburgh, holding the BSc and PhD degrees. He's a fellow of the Linnean Society of London, the Ghana Institute of Biology, and the Academy, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Also a member of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has held several leadership positions in this country. He has also served as the Deputy Director General of the CSIR Ghana, responsible for national research coordination of issues of the environment and health across Ghana. Served also several positions at the national level as listed in Forest Research Institute, Water Research Institute, the Soil Research Institute, the Center for Research into Plant Medicine in Mampong, the Co Research Institute, and so on. There are several areas where he has served, served this nation. At the international level, he previously chaired the Standing Committee of UNEP CMS, the subsidiary body on science technical and technological advancement of the Convention on Biological Diversity for its ninth and 10th meetings. He chaired the contact group on forest biodiversity at the sixth conference of parties, COP, of CBD in The Hague. He was also the vice chair of the standing committee of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. He was also a member of the Vital Science Oversight Council of Conservation International in Los Angeles, the Council of GEF Washington, the Council of African Center for Technology Studies in Nairobi, where he is currently chairs that council. Currently, he also chairs the Council for the African Center for Technology Studies in Nairobi, the Steering Committee on IPSI of the United Nations Institute of Advanced Sustainability in Tokyo. Ladies and gentlemen, indeed we are privileged to have with us our, our distinguished lecturer, Professor Otin Yeboa. Prof, your audience. Thank you, Chairman, for the occasion. President of the Academy, past presidents, vice presidents of the Academy, fellows of the Academy, excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, students, invited guests, and my family members. I consider this as a testimonial, and this is in gratitude to God for everything. And in talking about everything, I want to mention gratitude to the Academy, the President, past President, fellows, for accepting me to be a fellow of the Academy and giving me this honor, singular honor, to stand on this podium to speak about what I have done as part of my life history. Also, in reference to my parents, who at the tender age of 12 plus uh, they saw that there was a need for me to go out of them and start a secondary education which after 14 years ended up with a terminal degree of PhD to my teachers who guided my thoughts 
all through. My former students who gave me courage and encouragement. They gave me both courage and encouragement for the future. Friends who gave me good advice. Colleagues who worked sincerely with me. Christian fellowships who gave me opportunity to know God better. And finally, my nuclear family who prayed with me and suffered with me in many times along this academic journey. I will also like to express gratitude to sponsorship that were received to enable this particular lecture to come on. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, I have some objectives which have actually dictated this lecture. There are two of them. The first one is to explain to the extent possible the complexity of biodiversity, what biodiversity is all about beyond species and habitats, because many people say when you talk about biodiversity, you're only talking about species, counting them and the rest of it but we will look at the complexity and why human beings should care about biodiversity and the repercussions on human life and well-being of biodiversity if this biodiversity is lost. So that was the first objective. The second one is to use its explanation which I have just given or which I will give to illustrate my personal contributions to the biodiversity enterprise and to bring up suggestions on ways to address the needs to conserve a sustainably used biodiversity in Ghana. As an outline, I will be considering biodiversity as an infrastructure of life why this topic and then be looking at biodiversity in national regional and global development schemes then an aspect of biodiversity which is currently an issue which is extinction which is a threat to life then finally i will provide the definition of what biodiversity is and what does it contribute to human well-being and then consider the way that we measure biodiversity for development, how and when the use of the term biodiversity came into being because this is something which many people are anxious to hear and to know. So considering, I refer to that as the genesis of the biodiversity as a term, not just a scientific term, but becoming both an economic, social, and everything to do with human well-being. Then I will consider my modest contributions to this enterprise before I come up with a conclusion in which I intend that I will shift a paradigm instead of just considering biodiversity only as counting species. And in this country, what we consider biodiversity as wastelands, or wild land, wild life, wild life, we will look at it from another perspective. Now, this slide, I'm going to read some texts from some people who have looked 
at our globe from another angle and have also considered the components that make life possible within a global setting. And I'm reading from a statement which was made by Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan, in his book, Pale Blue Dot, written in 1994. He said, the Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Our planet is a lonely speck on the great enveloping cosmic dark. There's no limit that help can come from somewhere to save us from ourselves. The Earth is the only area to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species can migrate. The Earth is where we make our stand, preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we have ever known. I also want to make a reference to a statement recently made by the President of Ireland on the 21st of February. Okay, the statement that was made by the Irish president goes like this. Around the world, the library of life that has evolved over billions of years, our biodiversity is being destroyed, poisoned, polluted, invaded, fragmented, plundered, drained, and burned at a rate not seen in human history. What is now rightly referred to as the extinction crisis is due to us. Only a quarter of the world's terrestrial surface remains untouched by human hand, and even those places are not escaping the impacts of climate change. It is estimated that human activity has multiplied the normal rate of extinction at least 100-fold. We are the first generation to truly comprehend the reality of what we are doing to the natural world, and we may be the last the chance to avert much of the damage. With this knowledge comes an extraordinary burden of responsibility that we all are to share. This is a statement by the President of Ireland, 2019-21st February. Then there's another statement given by the Prime Minister of Canada, and I read, I do not need to tell you that we are the last generation that can act for the climate and biodiversity. Those two topics are closely linked. You cannot address one without the other. Climate change is threatening nature, our houses and our ways of life. When we destroy our natural ecosystems, this speeds up the process. Then I read another, this is from Albert Einstein in 1950. A human being is a part of the whole called by us as universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feeling as something separated from the rest a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal lives and to our fiction for a few persons nearest to us. Our task is to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion 
to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. I also quote from Professor David MacDonald from Oxford University, who said, without biodiversity, there is no future for humanity. Humanity is burning the library of life. And most recently, I would say about three weeks ago, another erudite professor of human ecology, who was one of the authors for the latest assessment, global assessment in Paris, said this. Life on Earth is an intricate fabric, and it is not like we are looking at it from the outside. We are threats in that fabric. If the fabric is getting holes and fraying, that affects us all. So coming to the title, Understanding Biodiversity as an Infrastructure of Life for Development, this refers generally to biodiversity knowledge, its acquisition, the generation of wisdom from it, and the use of it for development. So the question now is, what is life? And I quote, life is the state or condition Life is a state or condition of an organism in which it is capable of performing its animal or vegetable functions. It is a characteristic attribute or a phenomenon that is possessed by an entity and which preserves, furthers, or renders, reinforces its existence in a given environment. And from the Aristotelian soul com concept, it is the vegetative soul in reproduction and growth for plants. It is the sensitive soul directing mobility and sensation in animals. And it is the rational soul generating thought and reflections in humans. And that is the diagram uh, starting from the vegetative soul which is of plants, which is controlled by the sensitive soul of animals, because definitely plants are used by animals sensibly. And overarching all of that is the rational soul, which is the human, where thought and reflections are the order of the day. This is the concept which Aristotelian soul, concept of soul has given. Now, looking at the library of life, we see that there is a whole examples that are expressed in the following. Inheritance is one of them. Where you have the heredity of traits, which involves a study in genetics, DNA, RNA, character traits which are linked to protein synthesis to form us as individuals. Behavior, which is a response to the environment, that when there is heat or when there is something that is threatening you, your rational being will make you to just turn away from there. So you have physiological and ecological, which bring up the issues of signaling, which bring up the issues of camouflaging, nuptial dances, Parasitism, symbiosism, commensalism, territoriality, where I occupy here and I'm the only one who should be there, allelopathy. These are all behavioral symptoms which we notice in living organisms. Then there is also reproduction. Life begets life. You have offsprings that come as a result of ugami or sexuality. And in the process, you do then have fecundity, which indicates a population growth, 
the dynamics in population increases and decline, which also lead to death. Then you have the internal structures, cellular structure and composition, some of which are outwardly seen, like the ears, the hair, the faces. Others are internal, which operate on the basis of metabolism, where internally you do have physiology and biochemistry in which there's energy biochemical relations to provide energy for anabolism, catabolism, and also for respiratory activities. Then this concept of homeostasis, where in biochemistry you do have the uh, stable inner conditions, which is for an equilibrium situation in internal functions. And finally, growth and development, which are basic permanent structures which make us. And as I was saying, I was a 12 plus year old when I entered into secondary school. And by the time that I was coming out, I was bigger. And since then, my shape has not changed. Well, it has changed a little. <laughs> it has changed a little. So that is growth and development. So when we talk of infrastructure for development, it's the kind of development which is referred to as that which encourages and promotes the sustainable provision of food, medicines, water, and other human needs, including such cultural regulating and supporting services as we normally find around us, which meet the needs of our present generation, but without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs and their own aspirations. So here, infrastructure for development is being indicated as a situation where we have what we need to be able to live as humans, and the same conditions must prevail in the generations which are yet to come. So you can see development, you can see it as a product which can be traced back to biodiversity. I want to just make a reference to something which emanated from this concept of development, and that is what we refer to as the future we want. Now, this is confirmed through the reference from the Rio Plus 20 conference, which I will explain in a few minutes. When member states, when I talk of member states, I'm referring to the United Nations countries, in an outcome document which was referred to as the future we want, what they indicated was this. Intrinsic value of biological diversity as well as the ecological, genetic, social, economic, scientific, educational, cultural, recreational, and aesthetic values of biological diversity and its critical role in maintaining ecosystems that provide essential services, and in bold letters, are critical foundations for sustainable development and human well-being. And when we go to the next slide where we have the model of sustainable development, you will see in the center, sustainable, which is sustainability, where the social aspects of the people are provided for, the environmental aspects are provided for, and the economic aspects are provided for. But all of these provisions impinge on one another where you are asking whether what you're doing is bearable, what you're doing is viable, what you're doing is equitable. Now, when all of them, you have an equilibrium emanating from these, then one will say that the situation is sustainable. So I look at extinction as a threat to biodiversity. We are familiar that there has been five major extinctions of biodiversity in the long history which have been caused by massive volcanic eruptions. And according to some colleague scientists, 
we have already seen signs of the sixth extinction beginning. But some other scientists disagree that it is beginning. But those of you who had the opportunity to listen to two weeks ago on the 6th of May, all the world's press were focused on what is happening to our natural environment. This was a United Nations report, and that report was quite alarming. I'll come back to that in a few moments. It was alarming and must be attended to very quickly. And partly it gives credence to the fact that the sixth extinction has already begun if nothing is done. Now, this leads me to two biological products which this country has been endowed with and which people are harvesting at rates far beyond the capacity of those organisms to replenish themselves. The first one is rosewood. I'm sure this is not anything new to you. There has been news about the rosewood. I mean, if you consider the environment in which rosewoods are occurring, this is the savanna. And savanna is identified as the area where you have trees or shrubs which are distantly placed and large expanse of grassland. So the only trees which appear to have canopies are these rosewoods. They appear to be the timber, if you like, that have been left standing by generations past who thought that these plants or these trees are useful. They must be kept there. Now they have drawn the attention of people who are harvesting them and harvesting them to the extent that within a few years' time, the savanna Sahel will be with us. There are two very important species that are there, the Abagia nigra and Terocarpo sericinaceus. Now, mentioning these names, I was tasked yesterday by the Minister for Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation to stand side by side with him here, because yesterday happened to be the International Day for Biodiversity, and the theme was promoting indigenous foods because the theme, as a, national, as a global theme, is for food security and the rest of it. And I had to come up here to explain why these names, uh, Dabeja Nigra and Terocarpus Arenaceus. And I had the arduous task of educating many people here in this hall by indicating that when we use local names, they only remain local. But when you use scientific names, you are able to reach quite a large number of people because scientific names are the names that are accepted at the international level for communication. So if I talked about a bro, for example, I'm just using as an example. Even in Ghana, not everybody, not every tribe calls a bro a bro. But at least beyond the borders of Ghana and elsewhere, when you talk of Ziamese, you are actually referring to a bro, but they will understand, whoever hears it will understand it in the language that they are familiar with. But scientifically, Ziamese is the name. So I've just made a reference to this as the two examples of the rosewoods which are being harvested seriously in our Savannah region. Of course, the plants are useful. They are hardwood with very strong grain-sized uh, timber, which can be used in lumber. And outside this country, they are actually used for these products. The other one is chairs. And on the right-hand side is the base for a guitar, which means that some people need them. But should we allow it to be removed in 
in such a manner which has not been regulated. The next slide which I am showing is actually one of the logs that has been felled and which is actually ready for processing. In this particular slide, there is a description which gives you an idea of how this particular plant looks when it is being felled. The other species, which is from the animal, because I have to take example from a plant and also example from an animal, is pangolin. Now, there are four major groups of the pangolins. Three of them actually occur in our country. I'm sure when we look at the next slide, you will see what I'm referring to. I'm not sure whether any of us have seen these organisms before. This is pangolin, which at a particular time, one of our FM stations was uh, making it popular as bushmeat. But the rate at which this particular species is being harvested, they don't harvest it for the meat, they harvest it for the scales. The scales keratin are like the, our nails, which are used for some other products, especially in Asian countries. And because of the scales, life is being sniffed out of these animals from our environment. So coming basically now to the definition of biodiversity, I want to just give you an idea that biodiversity or biological diversity is the occurrence of different types of ecosystems, different species of organisms, with the whole range of their variants and genes that have been adapted to different climates and environments along with their interactions and processes. And over the last 30 years, many different definitions of biodiversity have been used. However, since 1992, when the Convention on Biological Diversity was signed and got ratified by many countries. Our country ratified it in 1994. Biodiversity is now being defined as the variability among living organisms from all sources, including, among others, terrestrial, marine, and other aquatic ecosystems, and ecological complexes of which they are part. Now, this includes diversity within species, diversity between species, and diversity of ecosystems. So when we get to the next level where the economic issue comes in, where we want to talk about the state or the trends or the tendencies, the state is the state which is the status, that is the way in which it is found, the trends which is taking into account all the uh, pressures that are mounted on this material and the tendencies which is what is likely to be if status quo remains. And we use a number of scientific measures, one of them being biodiversity indicators. Now, the biodiversity indicators aim at using quantitative data because it's very difficult to use qualitative data since comprehension, especially in language, is very difficult. It's an issue. But when you use quantitative data, including measuring um, some aspects of biodiversity, for example, ecosystem conditions, the services that the ecosystem is providing, and looking at the drivers that actually come on to, to bring about change. So this provides an understanding of how biodiversity is changing over time and space, why it is changing, and what the consequences of the changes are, particularly for ecosystem functioning, the services that they provide, and also human well-being. There are a huge variety of elements that are included in the definition, 
which result in a varied set of methodologies to measure the natural environment. So going back onto the state status and tendencies, trends and tendencies, you can talk about species richness, which is number of species that you can count in a given area. You can talk about population number, which is referring to number of genetically distinct populations of a particular species, which is defined, defined by analysis of a specific element of its genetic makeup. For example, morphological discontinuity. By morphological discontinuity, you get to a point where what you see is different from the next one. That's morphological discontinuity. Then we also have genetic diversity, which refers to the variation in the amount of genetic information within and among individuals. Then we also have a concept of species evenness, which is a measurement of how evenly individuals are distributed among species. Now that's a bit difficult to understand, but if we use the normal classroom situation where in the university, for example, or even in secondary school, where you have from one, from two, from three, and you look at from one, and you are asking, how many students are in from one? How many of them are females? How many of them are males? I mean, these are all quantitative measures which is going to come out. <coughs> and then we also look at the phenotypic, which is the outward appearance that is the characteristic of the organism. So all of these lead us into an idea of incidences of biodiversity loss. Because when you have taken all of these measures, there is an indication of something happening. There must be a trend, either the species are increasing or reducing. If they are reducing, which means the species are getting lost. So we look at what actually is within incidences of biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss threatens the provisions of goods and services that are provided by biodiversity and ecosystems. And reduction in biodiversity in any ecosystem actually can affect various activities such as decomposition rates, vegetation biomass, that is the quantities that you can pick up from a particular vegetation, and even in fish stocks. Last year, there was a ban, or there was an attempted ban on fishing. And of course, uh, there was resistance. The resistance was coming from artisanal uh, fishers. The reason simply because that is how they are able to make a living. But from a scientific point of view, what it meant was that the fish stock was reducing. The upwelling had gone down. Something drastic had to happen. How did they come to this? They came to this knowledge by always visiting the beach and seeing or looking at the landings. And when you look at the landings of fish stock that have been brought to the shore by the artisanal fisheries, fishers, you ask yourself, was this effort worth it? So it was a measure to at least allow the fish to grow. But of course, when there is no science and people do not understand some of these things that come as a result of research findings, it becomes very difficult to get into the heart of people. So there was resistance. I hope this time they have been so well educated to know that for their own benefit, the fish talk must be allowed to increase. And you see, when a fish stock is increasing, what it means is that the life cycle is made to ensure that there is growth. So when you pick up a tilapia, it will not be a tilapia of this size, but it will be a tilapia of that size. Now, whether from environmental collapse or gradual decline in function, our ability to adapt to a changing world may be considerably reduced if the environment on which we rely does not contain sufficient biodiversity to evolve and continue to support our needs. 
I'm still trying to convince all of us that biodiversity is actually the infrastructure of life, which is also for development. I want to just divert a little to look at the ecosystem functions which biodiversity promotes. It is clear that biodiversity underpins ecosystem function and the provision of ecosystem services. And of course, I will just quickly go over four services which we are familiar with, but we may not know that these are services that are provided because ecosystem is functioning. We have supporting services, we have provisioning services, regulating services, and cultural services. With the provisioning services, you are actually talking about food that we consume, like seafood, like game, bushmeat, and the rest, crops, wild foods, spices. We are also talking about raw materials, such as lumber, skins, fur wood. We also are talking about water, minerals. We're also talking about mineral, uh, genetic resources. We're talking about energy, which is in the form that has been captured by plants, particularly as a result of photosynthesis, developing into biomass fuels. We're also referring to ornamental resources. All of these are provisioning. They provide. They provide. So you can go and just collect. How did they provide? That's something which belongs to the scientists, but everybody must know. Because when you go to collect firewood, you must know how the firewood actually uh, was produced. Then we have regulating and cultural services. In regulating services, we are making reference to um, the benefits that are obtained through biodiversity and ecosystems processes, such as uh, when you have invasion resistance or maintenance of natural pests and diseases control, where you have pollination frequencies, climate regulation, and so on. Now, let me tell you, one of the reasons why we are so concerned about Atiwa Hill is because of the regulatory process that it provides for this country. Water is available every day because the vegetation on top of the hill, I would always say, is communicating with the heavens. So there is always water which is speculating down the arms of the um, stems onto the soil. And all of these just percolate the soil and they gather and come out as two strong, two, sorry, two, three, uh, sorry, come out as three important rivers which are useful to national development. Accra benefits from one of such rivers. Denso has been dammed to provide water. So think about it, regulatory service. Then cultural service. Sometimes when you are down and you get into a rose garden, sometimes when you need a period of invocation, you get into a botanic garden. All of these are cultural. They give you inspiration. They give you spiritual enrichment. And your cognitive thoughts get sharpened. You are able to reflect better. On a recreational basis, you become completely warmed up. And of course, apart from that, there's also the aesthetic experiences which come. The beauty. One would say the beauty is in the eyes <laughs> I'm sure you all know what I'm reading. <laughs> okay, the beauty is in the eyes of the of the of the holder, right? Or the beholder. It's in the eyes of the beholder. And sometimes others also add in the hands of the beholder. Or the holder. 
Okay, I'm intentionally twisting so that you, you will start thinking about what I'm trying to say. From an aesthetic point of view, there are many things that actually you are not able to explain. You just feel emotional about them. So, presently, all these services are summed up into one major body, which is nature's contribution to people. And this is the standard which is now being used at the international level to gauge the services which biodiversity, which promotes all of these services, are providing. Now, nature's contribution to people acknowledges that nature can either have beneficial or harmful effects on human well-being. And depending on the way you look at it, you actually see a benefit or you see a harmful uh, part of it. Where did the name or the term biodiversity come from? You know, biologists or scientists are always dealing with all kinds of things, changing things over, and the minds are thinking far and wide as to how to be able to capture the imaginations of the little pot which is in the treasury. When I talk of the little pot which is in the treasury, I'm referring to finances. There must be something catchy. We can continue doing our researches, talking about species and so on and so forth, but something must snap. Somebody must understand what you are talking about. So the term biodiversity actually came around somewhere in the 1980s, where people were looking at limits of growth. And it's attributed to one scientist called Rosen in 1985, during the planning for a national forum on biodiversity. But the term became more popular when at the end of a symposium, the whole thing was put together and E.O. Wilson, who is one of the foremost professors in biodiversity, put it together. So initially, the term biodiversity was used more in political forums But now the concept has evolved and has been included in the idea of ecosystem services in that it is a form of natural capital. And of course, economists among us here will understand when you talk of natural capital, you are actually referring to that hen that lays the golden egg, natural capital. And therefore, it underpins the functioning of ecosystems so when we go back looking at the elements for sustainable development, we see that biodiversity is an actual infrastructure of life for development and also as a concept. And it has been relied on, uh, has relied on the promotion and championing of institutions to enter into the global arena. So in the early 1980s through to now, Biodiversity actually entered into a decade of watershed in biodiversity recognition. This decade, that is from the 1980s, actually set the tone for delineating the three components of sustainable development. And in the three components of sustainable development, we refer to the social, economic, and environment. So elements for sustainable development, which we know, uh, for economic development, you are talking of materials of living natural resources which play an active role in provisioning. For social cohesion and behavior in aspects of cultures, materials of the living nature play roles. And for environmental sustainability, you have the presence of the living nature contributing to ecosystem services in the form of supporting and regulating services. There is something that we can say any time that we talk about biodiversity, and this is the concept of WEHAB. WEHAB is not a very big word, it's just an acronym referring to water, energy, health, agriculture, and biodiversity. Our own late Kofi Annan 
when he had to give evidence for the fact of developing a new way of looking at the economics of the world. He coined this word, we have. And for him, he thought that biodiversity was the new entrance. Biodiversity wasn't known at the time that much, and therefore it was a new entrant. And if you go back to looking at Agenda 21, Agenda 21 is a global perspective in development. We have was like a precursor to our understanding of the Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals, if you recall, was from the period 2001 to 2015. It's a 50-year period. Now, that was the period that biodiversity was supposed to now emerge with a new clothing. And our own Kofi Annan, when he brought out this terminology, we have, where he was referring to water, energy, health, agriculture. We knew all of these, but biodiversity was not known. What did it really contain? And his concept was that we ought to be able to understand this biodiversity properly. And of course, when you also recall the World Summit on Sustainable Development, which is also called the uh, Earth Summit 2 or Rio Plus 10, this was actually meant to pursue a new initiative on the implementation of sustainable development and the building of a prosperous and a secure future for citizens of the world. Now, the Millennium Development Goals, 2001, 2015, there were eight of such goals which were given, and every one of these were supposed to actually signify something. The question was whether we were able to achieve all of them. But of course, that had to be succeeded again by something else. But in between that time, Africa also had an agenda which is referred to as the Africa Agenda 2063. There were seven point agenda which Africa had promulgated, but two of them relate to biological diversity. I just mentioned the two. Modern agriculture for increased production, and then Africa's unique natural endowments, its environment and ecosystems, including its wildlife and wild lands are healthy, valued, and protected with climate resilient economies and communities. This is looking into 2063. 2063 from now is close to about 30 or 40 years. And this is the vision which Africa, through our leaders, AU, are promoting. That Wildlife, wild lands are healthy, valued, and protected with climate resilient economies and communities. At the same time, too, we will have modern agriculture for increased production, productivity, and value addition contributing to farmer and national prosperity and Africa's collective food security. So when we come back to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which was an assessment that was promoted under our illustrious son, Kofi Annan, from 2005. This was published, and the bottom line of the MA findings was that human actions are depleting the Earth's capital, natural capital, putting such strain on the environment that the ability of the planet's ecosystems to sustain future generations can no longer be taken for granted. And so, in 2005, there was a global meeting in Paris 
January 2005, where the President of France, usually it takes a leader who can see far to promote something. Jacques Chirac, he launched a call for action to set up some kind of a vision which would look like IPCC. IPCC is a climate change uh, view, but he wanted something for biodiversity, for biological diversity. And the reason, basically, was a process that will provide a critical assessment of the scientific information and policy options that required for decision making, particularly on biodiversity. Then we also had the Rio Plus 20. This is another activity which was promoted by the United Nations uh, Conference on Sustainable Development and this actually was in reference to what they refer to as the future we want. What kind of future do we want? Here, the Rio Plus 20 examined and reviewed the development path for the world's sustainable development through Rio Plus 10 and the Millennium Development Goals. Now, the Rio Plus 10, the Rio is referring to Rio de Janeiro, which is the uh, city in which a, an important conference of biodiversity took place in 1992. And of course, the result was what prepared the basis for what we now have, which we are aspiring for, that is the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. And if we go to the next slide, where you have the Sustainable Development Goals 2016, 2030, these are actually showed in the form of diagrams, but behind those symbols that you see are a whole network of activities which the global community is expected to undertake. A lot of them are very, very important. One of them, which is number four, which talks about quality education, like for our young ones here. The quality, of educa quality education here is not only for the young ones, because when you look at goal 4.7, it is actually talking about community education, the kind of things which our NCCE is supposed to be promoting, that we do not leave plastic bags or plastic containers just anyhow, the kind of information which is needed to ensure that our environment is clean. So with these development goals, we are expecting that our world through the 2030 agenda, which introduced the 17 sustainable development goals, will seek to eradicate poverty and inequality, guarantee equal and fair access to food, health, water, decent work, education, and energy. Then in the next slide, I go to where very important economic decisions are made. And this is the World Economic Forum. This took place this year, January 2019. And what excites me is in the introductory text to the stream that discussed the World Economic Forum, where it says, globally, nature provides services worth around $125 trillion a year, a year. Yet, the world is set to witness a two-thirds decline in wildlife populations over the half century from 1970 to 2020. 2020 is just next door. With time running out on international agreements, how can business and government come together to deliver on targets for climate, oceans and conservation. This is the issue that was discussed. And the general forum concentrated on leveraging green financial products 
harnessing technology for resource management and advancing systematic, systemic policies for environmental challenges. Then I'm look, also making a reference to G7. G7 is the seven industrialized countries who are meeting uh, sometime in August this year. And they have a theme, fighting equal inequality. And the sub theme is on environmentally responsible and committed to gender equality. Now, biodiversity and business will feature in this exclusive meeting. Now, all of these important global activities, as you can see, clearly indicate that nature in the form of biodiversity is now being taken seriously to address those portions of the sustainable development goals that give confidence to sustainable living and human well-being. Now I come to my contributions over the years to this biodiversity enterprise. I begin first with researches in morphology, anatomy for classification, and also for ecology. There has been a search for elements to bring order into the classification of a plant group, Cyperaceae cyperoidi. I think what can easily give us what I'm referring to is if you look at tiger nuts, tiger nuts, that plant that produces tiger nuts. That is the Cyperaceae cyperoidi. Now, I pay specific attention to two, in fact, the whole genera within that subgroup, but I'm making a reference to two of them, Scapus and Firena. And of course, this led to an observation, a very important observation of the genus Scapus and Firena, where uh, the presence of bundle sheet in the anatomy of the plant indicated a respiratory path in photorespiration, which may classify the plant in either a C3 plant, a C4 plant, or a CAM plant. All of these are related to ecological situations of these plants as they exist. So wherever you may find any of these, they are there because of a particular photo respiratory process which they are undertaking. And that observation which I made was a very significant one. Now the next slide is actually showing a picture of one of the uh, groups, Scapus. This is a normal grass. We call it grass, but in Fi, uh, the other version is the Ubronia Tuata. Uh, it's, it's a funny name, but it's, it, it's very, very strong, you know. Uh, <laughs> the, the next slide will show the other, other group, which is Furena, also has this kind of tendency where the bundle sheet is associated with photorespiratory process. Then I also looked at some variation studies in three genera, Costos group, Peleostigma group, and Clausina group. Now the interesting thing, which in the next two slides will show, is on Peleostigma. Peleostigma is one plant which uh, is used in uh, dye. Dye, they remove the bark and use it to make dyes. Now there are two species which occur mostly in the savanna areas. But they come together at a particular point where they hybridize. Hybridization meaning that they are able to exchange pollen and therefore new species or hybrid species emerge in between them. Now the diagrams, the first one is actually showing the distribution pattern of Peleostigma toningiae, which is mainly found in Guinea savanna situations. The second slide of the distribution shows Peleostigma reticulatum 
which is mainly in the Sudan savannah. But when you look at the belt, you will find that there is an overlap where the two species actually come together. And this is a very important and very interesting area where you do have the two species hybridizing and therefore their distinctness is not apparent. The next slide is Clausina anisata and this is one species which attracted a lot of attention because of the constituents that they have and I'm happy Professor Abdamiensa is here. One of his students actually went through this particular species for a PhD. My student went through this for an MSc. But the important thing is that when you look at the distribution range of a particular species, then you begin to understand how the genetic composition is either very expansive or contracting. And the yield in terms of oils that they will produce and so on is related to how much um, uh, that particular gene which is responsible for uh, providing that is. The next slide is actually a research on local and indigenous uses and their knowledge base. This is one area that has attracted my attention very much and it did as a result of a joint project that we had in the northern part of Ghana where me being a pure scientist, a natural scientist, now rubbing shoulders with my colleagues from the social sciences. And I must say that that was a turning point in my research work because I became now attracted to what is it that is making people do the kind of things that they do with plants. My initial studies have always been in the abstract science where I will go and I don't talk to the plants, but I use the plants. I don't talk to them. But here, I'm getting an interaction where people have used the plant and they make something out of it. My question was, how did they come into an understanding of what it is that is there which can be useful? And it's interesting, at the international level, local knowledge is now being recognized as very, very relevant. Because previously we thought local knowledge was all full of witchcraft and this kind of thing. But it's now being recognized that it is important that we get to the base to find when the doctor was not there, what did the people do? How did they cure themselves? And in three traditional groves in northern Ghana, located in Maoshegu, Taliwana, and Iwogu, I was able to interact with the local people to understand how they feel about certain groups of plants which they have and which they cherish so much in their premises, to the point that the traditional groves which are actually overseen by a tindana. When you talk of a tindana, it's like an overlord, somebody who is in charge, making sure nobody goes there where you are not permitted. You can only go there where you have done the right thing. By the right thing, I mean you have seen the tindana and have paid the needed fees to be able to enter. because of modernization. And Tamale was also sprawling. And these traditional groves were under pressure. What were the people looking for? They were looking for such basic things as firewood and things like this. So what we did in consultation with the people, we organized trips to the reserve places where we could fetch the kind of plants that the people needed and brought them and planted them, physically planted them in the uh, areas beyond the restricted zones. 
You know, there is, you know, in the UNESCO system, there is the core. The core is where you don't go there without permission. You only go under supervision. But the peripheral areas are where people can go. Now, if those things what the people need are available, of course, they won't dare to go into the, um, um, the reserve areas. And we managed to bring up a whole body of plant communities which the people around Iwogu, the people around Talewana, the people around Mahashigo have been using up to now. Then there was another one which took me to Wichiao in Upper West. If anybody goes back, uh, you, even now, you can Google www.wichiao. There is a sanctuary there. That sanctuary was established because there was a notice of orphaned hippopotamus, which as a result of the inundation of the Bui Dam were going to be at the mercy of whoever. And to educate the people in Wichiao, we spent days with them. First, we wanted to identify the forage which the hippos would consume. Secondly, we wanted to identify the type of farming systems. And of course, we then, in interaction, provided the basis for agro, uh, we call it um, the basis for uh, sustainable agriculture, where you don't use fire. Because in the northern, upper west, upper east, the use of fire is very rampant. But here, there was an understanding that you don't need to burn. No burn kind of agriculture. And by God's grace, we were able to raise the forage for the hippos. By God's grace, the people understood the need to actually raise that area as a tourist attraction. And that's why I'm saying that if you Google Wichiao, you will see that there is a signboard which is indicating that they are there every time that you go there and you will be given the fine accommodation on the banks of the Black Volta. The third aspect is actually advocacy. Like yesterday, which was International Day for Biodiversity, and in fact there are several days in which we concentrate as a nation to remind ourselves about heritage that we have in this country. And one of the things that I have been involved in has been talking on, on radio, television, and having interaction with students, talking to clergy. Even I use the pulpit. Sometimes I preach. I use the pulpit to talk to people about what it is that is available, which is a heritage which God has given to us. And the last part, which is the multilateralism, that one is a very difficult part. Multilateralism is something that involves a give and take kind of function. You can leave the shores of Ghana with perceived ideas. And when you meet as a group, from different countries, everybody has come with his or her own nation's ideas. How you compromise to get something which is of essence to the global community depends on the dexterity of negotiation. And my involvement as a member of Ghana's parties to many of these conventions have provided an opportunity for me to be able to articulate properly and to be able to convince people that it is important that we provide succor for these biological resources which God has given to us. And by the way, I forgot to mention that when I talk of biodiversity as an infrastructure of life, it is that which was not developed by man. It is that which God created. 
It's God's own manufacturing. That's why I call it a manuf uh, an infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Any other thing which man makes, roads, buildings, these are infrastructures which man makes. But biodiversity is actually a natural infrastructure which God has created for us. There are many things that I can say in this area of policy development because at that level where you have opinions coming from different countries, it is not Ghanaian opinion that is going to hold sway, neither is it European opinion that is going to hold sway. It is dependent on the material that is being discussed and how people are able to agree and disagree. Of course, we can disagree, come back again and agree, or you can come back again and disagree, but in the process, what you're actually coming up with some kind of an understanding. And that has been one good weapon which God has given to me that I'm able to discuss issues properly with people. There is one process which came up lately. Um, okay, I think in this picture here, you see where the arrow is. You look very carefully to, to the arrow. The arrow, the arrow is pointing to on the stage. Uh, let, maybe I can use the pointer here. That is me sitting there. <laughs> and this was just three weeks ago in Paris when the global assessment was introduced. I was the rapporteur taking down notes, indicating reactions of governments, indicating reactions of stakeholders and everybody. And it was a fantastic feeling for me that I stand at the forefront of a global agreement on assessment which is indicating that we are actually biting more than we can chew. And in the process of our biting more than we can chew, we are destroying God's infrastructure that he has made available for us to use. When we go to the next slide, you will notice that I have actually given a summary of what the whole thing was about. That it's a new UN report warning that humans were destroying the Earth's natural ecosystems at an unprecedented pace. The findings were sobering. That you have millions of acres of wetlands and rainforests being cleared. As many as one million plant and animal species are now threatened with extinction. I've already indicated what it means when a particular species goes extinct. And bear with me, we are all Ghanaians. Anywhere you look, nature is vanishing before our eyes. Everywhere you look, nature is vanishing before our eyes. Can we do something about this? And I want to quote the refrain, Obama's refrain. Yes, we can. I want to just provide a few opinions before I come into suggestions which, for me, are very relevant for government uptake. And I quote from Arusha Ghana on their conclusion of the 2019 budget analysis. I quote. The government of Ghana has rightly identified environmental sustainability as a fundamental development element for achieving development beyond aid. However, the 2019 budget fails to demonstrate and integrate the, in the dependencies and trade-offs and its investment planning, which means a huge deficit exists in securing environmental services and goods. The current focus on extractive development agenda to spearhead our development paradigm of Ghana Beyond Aid will leave huge environmental footprints for which our GDP cannot support and remedy. The current figures of environmental degradation standing at 19% of our economy 
should engender greater investment and action to mitigate these negative consequences to secure our natural resources, paying attention to systematic approaches, systematic approaches that prioritize protection and security of ecosystems in all sectors of Ghana's economy. I also, in the next slide, gave you a recent report on Ghanaian biodiversity. And the report says, much of Ghana's biodiversity, which is located in forests, and an analysis by Global Forest Watch stated that Ghana has the fastest rate of deforestation in the world, with 60% more trees cut down in 2018 than the already high 2017 number. The next point is, the biggest drivers of Ghana's deforestation are stated to be the impact of mining and the expansion of agriculture at the expense of forest. In the next slide, and this is from the Ghanaian Times. The distressing news of the destruction of the Department of Parks and Garden and the accompanying editorial by the Ghanaian Times of 17 May 2019. News about the felling of more than 140 trees, 5,000 flowers and other ornamental plants on the 10-acre land at Cantonments for the construction of a multi-purpose office complex. That's the first one. And this immediately brings me back to the Academy's conference last year, which was looking at global cities, sustainable cities. The next is the argument of timber logging causing degradation and not deforestation and vice versa. This was a tussle between Cocoa Board and the Ghana Civil Society Cocoa Plan, uh, Platform. So the question is, what does the Forestry Commission say? Forestry Commission is mute. Now the next slide, I'm actually making some reflections. The time of overlooking nature, in particular its living components, is over. The business as usual attitude of using nature in any way we feel without considering the future generations is no longer an option. We must now bend the curve to stop biodiversity and ecosystem losses and declines. There must be a paradigm shift. And in the paradigm shift, I have listed quite a number of suggestions which I think wherever this must go, they should go because we want to have our biodiversity thriving. Number one, understand fully that biodiversity in Ghana is a naturally endowed infrastructural heritage of life existing within Ghana's territorial space. And by territorial space, I'm referring to land, sea, and air. Exploit this heritage for national development along the tenets of sustainability implied in the SDGs and Africa Agenda 2063. Make a special effort to train more experts from among the young Ghanaian scientists. I'm sure our young ones this way and that way are listening attentively to this. Encourage the filling of gaps in knowledge about Ghanaian biodiversity and ecosystem functions through special national sponsorships. There are certain courses in our universities and training uh, uh, establishments which are almost dying because students don't see the future in them. Now, if there is a need in the country to encourage filling gaps in knowledge, because there is so much gaps in knowledge which have to be filled. We have no idea of the kind of heritage in terms of biological wealth that this country has. One area alone in Atiwa, one small area alone, has a history which is unprecedented. But we need people 
to be able to do the studies. Develop strategies and implement policies along global multilateral environmental agreements at the local, district, and national levels. And this emphasizes mainstreaming. Mainstreaming, interestingly, is a program which the Ministry of Environment, through the Connect Project, is currently pushing in all the sectors of the Ghanaian economy. Create measures to stop deforestation by providing and supporting clear legal frameworks that strengthen land tenure and contribute to greening commodity value chains. When land tenure is not secure, then you have changes, land changes, land use changes over a period. We want security for land tenure. Implement existing sustainable forest management practices including compliance and enforcement regimes that play important roles in fighting illegal logging and mining, as well as preventing unsustainable exploitation of timber species. Now, this point that I'm bringing up is actually addressing my own colleagues. Protect, study, document, and sustainably utilize biodiversity to benefit the present and future generations. And here, I'm also making a reference to MMDAs, academic and research institutions, who should address this part of the information. Next is encourage equity in the sharing of benefits arising from the use of genetic resources of Ghanaian origin. And there is a protocol which Ghana has signed but we need to document this protocol in our legal system. We ought to domesticate it in our legal system. As far as possible, use all knowledge systems available in Ghana, including a deliberate search for and documentation of Ghanaian traditional knowledge, recognizing its propriety according to international laws, norms, and practices in order to promote national interest. Enhance the legal, traditional, and customary protection of important locally and internationally recognized rich biodiversity sites and those that are habitats for totem organisms and other endangered or threatened species. Broaden our definitions of what constitutes human progress by including measures such as natural capital, social capital and human capital in our national statistics for development. Consider challenges which often present themselves in our quest to develop as opportunities for reflection in order to build resilient infrastructure, promote sustainable industrialization and foster innovation as required in goal number nine of the sustainable development goals to reach the goals of no poverty, zero hunger, decent work, health, and education. Establish the concept of citizen science. I will explain this, and use scientists within Ghanaian communities to explain science issues and be responsible to citizens' concerns and needs. And from this experience, energize the citizens themselves to produce reliable scientific knowledge. Citizen science is involving all manner of people to be involved in acquiring or collecting data. When was the last time you saw Apetupre? When was the last? I mean, these are all issues that should encourage people. Do we now, these days, see vultures? Do we find them? All these are questions which, from a citizen's point of view, they can just be enumerating them. And that becomes citizen science. Because then they provide that basic information which the scientists will go back to search for. Promote SDG Goal 4.7 on global citizenship. Now, global citizenship is being aware of the environment in which you live so that you will pay attention. And here, I'm actually 
requesting and encouraging the NCCE, National Center for Civic Education. I'm encouraging them to collaborate with EPA, Man and Biosphere Group, to collaborate with the National Commission of UNESCO, to collaborate with the Ministry of Environment, Science, Technology, and Innovation, to collaborate with MLRGA, that's the Ministry of Local Government and Rural Development, to collaborate with the environmental NGOs. Why? This is because in global citizenship, this is where people can stand up and say that this is not right. The last but one, embrace the elements of world ethic for living sustainably in the sense of respecting the community of life and educate people to be responsible for the actions that they take on the environment. In 1996, we organized a research trip to search for, for three commodities, mushroom, snails, and um, these leaves uh, which are used in wrapping uh, cocoa, sorry, watching. I'm only just going to talk to you about what we found about the mushroom. Some people, during our investigation, we were just talking, some people will go to where uh, the mushroom appeared the last time because they know that the tematorium is there and dig up the tematorium and go and hide it somewhere which only they would know. But, you see, nature has its own way of reacting. They did this several times, and in the end, there was a shortage of mushrooms. Shortage of mushrooms. Because, I mean, the termites are not, they are not fools. You cannot just go and dig them. Do you know how the mounds came about? And that brought about a shortage of mushrooms at a certain time in 1993, 94, 95. The, young, the older ones will remember this, as I indicate. There was also the issue of snails. As for the snails, there is a taboo in the Akan areas where you do not use search lights in the night to pick them. Because these snails are nocturnal, and it is only at that time that they come out to feed. What some people were doing was they would just go and spread rotten organic material in a trail. And of course, the snails being nocturnal will be attracted to this. And dead in the night, between 12 and 1, these people will then go into the forest and start picking the snails to the extent that they almost eliminated the snails that were giving rise to young ones. So when I talk of world ethic for sustainable living, I'm, respect, I'm referring to respecting the community of life. And we need to educate people to be responsible for their actions. The last one, and this one is actually in relation to getting the money that is needed we need to deliberate. We need to undertake a deliberate and firm action to finance, implement, and monitor all climate and environmental sustainability related actions captured in our own medium term development plans. This is because the drivers for the two are the same. But it appears that we are paying more attention to climate issues and neglecting biodiversity. And one statement that I have always said, and I have always also been proved right, that if we take good care of our biodiversity, climate issues will be only a thing of the past. 
So in conclusion, Mr. Chair, thank you for tolerating me. I want us to rise up to our generation's greatest challenge. And our generation's greatest challenge is of halting the loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services. For me, this will be in preparation for a prosperous future which we want to bequeath to the next generation of Ghanaians, these ones over here. Thank you very much. Let's give a clap again to our distinguished speaker. I'm sure we could have gone on and on listening to the Kenyan dimensions on some of the examples that he was giving. Especially if you've grown in a rural community and the life, the life of 1950s and the life of 1960s the life of 1970s, 80s, and 90s. they've changed, partly linked to biodiversity, the way we have handled biodiversity. The very lucid example he gave about the wise snail hunters, for example, or the wise mushroom hunters. Really, the survival of the next few generations as he has carefully mapped up for us, depends on what we do today. And he's giving us quite a long task of must do, things that we should be doing. And I believe this sets the stage for maybe the academy taking on your lecture and the assessing points and dealing up with all the institutions that you mentioned need to collaborate. They need to collaborate and collaborate and collaborate for effectiveness for development. I'm not going to summarize this lecture. We've heard him speak very clearly and eloquently. And I trust that in your little corner, wherever you are, biodiversity issues will now be moved to the front and you will act accordingly. Thank you very much. Shall we please give the chairman a hand? Thank you very much. We'd like to acknowledge the following sponsors. Conservation Alliance, Arucha Ghana, Tropim, Tropim Boss Ghana, Plant Genetic Resources Research Institute for sponsoring this event. Shall we please clap for them? Yeah. I've been told that CSIR is also a sponsor. So, so sorry to you. We would want to acknowledge the following schools for being here. ATTC, Accra Girls, Accra West and Accra Wesley Girls. Please let's clap for them. <laughs> Next week, Thursday, 30th of May, we'll have the Ephraim Amo lectures. The speaker will be manifest, also known as Kwame Tsikata. The topic will be reimagining us the role of popular music in self actualization. I believe it to be very informative. So shall we all plan to, to be here, to hear uh, manifest, deliver the Ephraim Amo lectures next week. The last announcement is that there will be refreshment outside. So please make yourself available for the refreshment. Shall we please rise? We've come to the end of
Please sit for a minute. Uh, the, the, the speaker says he needs to do something. I requested to uh, recognize the presence of my family members here. My wife is here, my senior brother uh, is here, and I think my daughters or my sons are here. So family members, can you please just rise up? And actually, I was expecting old students of Boca State College here. <laughs> Where are you? Where are they? Oh, my. <laughs> Please, let's rise as the party leads. 